الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله. All praise due to Allah. May Allah's peace and blessings be on the last messenger of Allah. <coughs> This evening's topic, as has been already identified, let's talk about love. Addresses one of the most powerful emotions that human beings experience. The force of love is one which every human being is driven by at different points in his or her life. It may be a drive for good or it may be a drive for evil. It is so well known and so attractive that Christians, for example, today base their evangelical activities around love. God is love. Very attractive. So, it is important for us as Muslims to have a proper understanding of love in the life of a Muslim. Where should it be placed? How should his or her life be guided by it? And if we consider that the most important thing in our life, the most critical issue which determines our future, our present, that most important factor is none other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So when we go and look at issues of love, this has to be our starting point. We have to start with what is most important and put everything in its context. And what we find when we look into the teachings of Islam is that love is connected with the most fundamental belief in Islam with regards to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself. It is among the pillars, among the foundations of Tawheed. So anyone who will tell you that Islam is about rules and regulations, laws and punishments. And, but our religion is about love. As if there is no love in Islam, know that that is false. It is so false that without this emotion of love being expressed through the context of Tawheed, a Muslim falls into shirk. The greatest possible sin that he or she could commit, which would destroy the good deeds that they may do in this life, and relegate them to hell in the next. I would say that on the basis of that, love is an integral, an important, a critical part of Islamic belief. Belief and of course, practice. 
Because that belief from the Islamic perspective isn't real unless it is manifest in action. Because belief is not merely what we think we feel in our hearts. But it is what is stated on our tongues. And it is what is done by our limbs. It is how we live our lives. That is real belief. And if we look back into the past, using the Quran as our yardstick, we can see that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when he described the disbelievers, he identified a basic belief which they held, and that was the belief in Allah. The pagans, who we refer to as the mushrikun, for the most part, they believed in Allah. As most people on earth today believe in Allah. Of course, their concept of Allah may be distorted in one way or another, but they believe in God. Those who disbelieve in God are few. The atheists, though they may be very loud and vociferous, Hawkins, Dawkins, and the other kins. They may be very loud in the media, but reality is that they are few. A small number. Then they've always been a few. Which is why Allah doesn't hardly address them in the Quran. Few verses, Allah drops a bomb on them here and there. But basically, Allah addresses the normal human beings. Yes. Those who don't believe in God are abnormal. The normal human beings, the norm for human existence, in all parts of the world, whether we go to the jungles of the Amazon or the Eskimos of the North Pole, wherever we go on the face of the earth, People believe in God. But that belief in God is not enough. As Muslims, we believe that the root of that belief was planted at the time of human creation. At the time of the creation of Adam, when all of Adam's descendants were created at the same time, in the Barzakh. And Allah told them, Alastu bi Rabbikum. And they said, Bala shahidna. Am I not your Lord? And they all bore witness, yes. You are our Lord. So, every human being is born with that seed. That seed of belief, which leads him or her, wherever he is or her in the world. To believe in God. But that belief in God is not enough. Because, as Allah said, وَمَا يُؤْمِنُ أَكْثَرُهُمْ بِاللَّهِ إِلَّا وَهُمْ مُشْرِكُونَ Most of those who believe in Allah commit shirk. But that belief in itself is not enough. It has to be manifest in life. How we live our lives. This is where the shirk comes. They say they believe, and Allah says, Wala in man samawati wal If you ask them who created the heavens and earth, they will say Allah. They recognize it. But when it comes to practice, what you find is that they worship other than Allah. 
And that worship can take a variety of different forms. And that is why we are talking about the topic of love tonight. Because this is one of the critical areas in which human beings in our modern times, human beings who carry Muslim names, born into Muslim families, go through the rituals of worship, Hajj, fasting, and etc. But there is a rotten seed in their hearts. The seed of shirk. Manifest in their misguided approach to love. This powerful emotion. And Allah addressed it 1,400 years ago in the Quran. And this verse was recited by our brother in the very beginning. And there are among men, humankind, those who take for worship others besides Allah as equal to him they make equals to Allah they love them as they should only love Allah but those who believe have a greater love of Allah this is a very powerful verse they love them as they should love Allah. How is that manifest today? Well, to understand it, we need to understand how should we love Allah? How is that love expressed? Is it by spinning around in circles? You have some people who say, I express my love of Allah by wearing what is like a skirt and I spin around in a circle and it raises up like a ballerina, you know. <laughs> and um, they say, well, you know, that's how I show my love for Allah. Well, in your mind, in your heart, you might think that this is love and how you love Allah. But that is not how Allah told us to love Him. This is not what He told us. This is not what Prophet Muhammad told us to do. And that should be our criterion. Our criterion of love. How do we express that love? And of course, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not leave this as a philosophical area that people had to go and philosophize about and you know, everybody's got a different opinion of how do we really love Allah? Well, of course, if you listen to some people out there, it would seem that way. As we said, some of them are spinning around in circles, some jump up and down, and some do all kinds of things. All of it in the name of loving Allah. But Allah is very clearly stated in the Quran. قُلْ إِن كُنْتُمْ تُحِبُّونَ اللَّهِ فَاتَّبِعُونِي يُحْبِبْكُمُ اللَّهِ Very simple, very basic. If it is that you love Allah as you claim, then follow Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and Allah will love you. Very simple, uncomplicated, straightforward. And that is Islam. And that is the beauty of Islam. That its teachings are crystal clear. 
not clouded in all kinds of philosophical concepts, etc. Of course, Muslims sometimes do it. They make it complicated. But the real teachings, they're very clear. So, following Prophet Muhammad وسلم, is the criterion for determining the love of Allah. That's how we express our love of Allah, fundamentally. To follow the Prophet So, for those who spin around in circles, we ask them, well, did Muhammad Sallallahu tell you to do this? So like you're following him, so we can know, yes, following this, doing this is a way of showing our love for Allah. They say, some of them say, yes. Yeah, he used to do that too. Some are honest and say, well, no, 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 he didn't. But others say, no, 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 he did, he did. So, how do you know that he did this? Um, we have some hadith narrated. Say, yes, yes, we have a chain. The golden chain. Okay, yes. MashaAllah, okay, let's have a look at that chain. Because that's how we determine whether something is truly from Rasulullah or not. You know? In terms of our practices and what we hold to be Islamic, that's what we have, this Senad. This is what we are known for. We are the Ummah of the Senad. This gives us authenticity. So when somebody in Turkey says, well, in the Topkapi Museum we have a tooth which was the tooth knocked out of the Prophet Sallallahu mouth in the Battle of Uhud. And in Pakistan, they say the same thing. And in Morocco, they say they have the tooth there. And so many different countries, there are people who claim to have this tooth. Maybe five, six, seven of them. We know you only lost one. Right? So we say, well, hey, what happened here? How do we know which one was actually the truth? Tooth. We said, well, okay. It had, there has to be a senate. When the tooth was knocked out, Sahabi Fulan picked it up, pocketed it, and he handed it down to his son, and they handed it down, and okay, it got to the museum. But if we don't have that chain, then what we have is an empty claim. No matter who claimed it, without that chain, we have an empty claim. People may make it very big and glorious. They, in the museum, they put it in special covering and gold and, you know, lights on it. And, you know, when you see it, wow, a tooth. <laughs> but it doesn't matter. No matter how beautiful it might look to us, it's not the tooth. We don't have the senate. There's no proof. So it is just an empty claim. Similarly, when we go to that chain of those who say Prophet Sallallahu used to spin around in circles like a top, and we look in the chain, we see Sahabi at one end, and we see a chain of sheikhs. And then there was a point between the last of the sheikhs and the sahabi, sahaba. We see a name. Khidr. Khidr. What's he doing there? There is Khidr. You know, Khidr is still alive. He is the one who passed it on to the sheikh of our order. This is nonsense. This is nonsense. Imam Bukhari, Imam Muslim, all the imma of hadith, they never accepted any hadith with khidr in the chain. None of them. They never accepted it. So, we cannot. So those claims that this is our way of showing love is 
love of Allah, their claims are false claims. They have no evidence to support them. What we find instead is Prophet Muhammad telling us to follow him by Allah's command in the Quran. Because following him, following his instructions is following Allah's instructions. That's why. As Allah said, Allah. Whoever obeys the messenger has obeyed Allah. So, this is the basis. And to develop that love of Allah, wherein Allah will love us, we have the hadith in which the Prophet ﷺ had said that the servant doesn't come close to Allah in any way except by doing the things which Allah had made obligatory on him. This is the starting point. By doing the obligatory aspects of Islam. This is the starting point. We want to gain the love of Allah. We want to show the love of Allah. Then we do it by beginning with the farad. And then the Prophet ﷺ went on to say that when the servant of Allah continues after doing the obligatory to do the voluntary acts, because every obligatory act has voluntary components to it. Supportive voluntary acts from the same origin or essence of that compulsory act. And he said that when he does that, when the slave of Allah, when he or she continues to worship Allah through doing these voluntary acts, because they're not required, it has come from themselves, then Allah will love him or her. Allah will love that person. And when Allah loves that person, what happens? When Allah loves that person, the Prophet ﷺ had said, he becomes the hearing by which he hears. The hearing by which he hears. What's, what does that mean? Allah becomes his hearing. It means that he only listens to the things which are pleasing to Allah. Not that Allah literally becomes his ears and instruments inside his head which convey sounds into his brain. But he or she only listens to what is pleasing to Allah. وَإِذَا خَاطَبَهُمُ الْجَاهِلُونَ قَالُوا سَلَامًا When the ignorant, the ignorant people speak to them, communicate to them, they say, Salam, peace, and go in another direction. They don't sit around with them, get involved to hear corruption. This is the way that Allah becomes their hearing. So what does that mean? It means in practical terms, as a Muslim, we must protect our ears. We don't go to places or sit in places where we will hear what is haram. Whether it is people talking, 
They're talking about others, backbiting, slander, all these kinds of things. We avoid that. Or whether it is music. Music. Backbiting and slander, everybody's... Yeah, we all know that one. But music? Yes. Music. Music, as we know it today, produced by wind and stringed instruments, is haram. Yes. It has entered upon us. We are inundated by it. You can't even go to the bathroom without hearing music. I mean, it's something I experienced in the West, but I also found it here. I went to a couple of bathrooms here and I heard music coming at me, piped in. What is the purpose of that? Make you hurry up and get back out and get back to buy or what? <laughs> it's a challenge. And we should be clear on this point. Because of course you have people who will say, Oh, Ibn Hazm! He said there are no authentic hadiths on music. And Sheikh, this one and that one said, Yeah, music's okay. I listen to it. <laughs> but when we look at the tradition of the early scholars of Islam, they made all kinds of statements against it. And there are hadiths which are sound. This topic, we should research it and be clear on it. Not go according to what is pleasing to us. That shouldn't be our criterion. Because I like music, I like to hear those who say it's okay. Those who say it's not okay, I don't like to hear them. This is not our criterion. You know, some people say, well, oh, you know, Dr. Bilal is an old guy, you know. <laughs> he, doesn't, uh, he doesn't listen to it because he, he doesn't really know. Well, some of you may know that, yeah, I used to be a lead guitarist in a rock group. Yeah. It's not a part of my bio. <laughs> but that was the reality. When I lived here in Malaysia, yeah, in East Malaysia, in Sabah, I was lead guitarist. Alhamdulillah, I found Islam. My bass player also found Islam, and the drummer also found Islam later. Alhamdulillah. None of us played music after that. But the point is that the allure and the power of music, I know it. And it became so obvious to me when after accepting Islam, and I was still playing in nightclubs, I accepted Islam, and then I divorced myself from the culture of the other members of the group in which I played. So I didn't participate with them in the intoxicants and things that people were doing and taking. So, in the nightclubs, I used to be the only sober one. I'm there playing away and people are dancing. And, and you know, I just looked at this and I could 
see that this was so devilish. You know, when Allah speaks about, you know, how shaitan prods the people, يَعُزُّهُمْ أَزَّا You know, <laughs> that's exactly what was going on. You know, I could see it. It was clear. Clear. So, this power that music has over people, where people end up loving it, loving it more than they love the Qur'an. This is, يُحِبُّونَهُ كَحُبِّ اللَّهِ Their love for it, and that is why even attempts to replace it with anashid. Okay? It started out innocently, but then the anashid ended up like Rock groups. The Anashid artist comes in, there's smoke on the stage, and you know, he's, hey, what's the difference? It's gone right back to that same thing. And people will enjoy, listen to Anashid, you turn on the Quran and say, hey, no, I want to hear this, uh, this artist or that artist. They feel more pleasure in hearing Anashid then hearing the Qur'an itself. What is that? What is that scale? What has happened here? This is real. As some scholars refer to music, they refer to it as the Qur'an of shaitan. Satan's Qur'an. And it goes into the heart. And it occupies the heart. And when it occupies the heart, there's no room for the Qur'an of Allah. That's the reality. It squeezes it out. And how you can know how powerful and the grip that it has on the human heart, you can find it in the fact that if somebody plays Two bars of a song which you didn't hear for 20 years. You heard it 20 years ago when you're a kid. But all you need to hear is just dun 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 dun. Ah, it's back in your head. The whole song is there. Words, everything, it's all there. Like it never left. That is the way it is. This is real. So when Prophet Muhammad warned us about it, he warned us about something which was dangerous. Dangerous for our souls. That's what Islam is there to do, to protect our souls. So, we have to divorce ourselves from this obsession. And no doubt it becomes an obsession. Among the other areas of love which represents a phenomena in this society, maybe somewhat different from other Muslim societies on a larger scale is the human love when a man loves a woman and a woman loves a man. Is Islam against love? That kind of love? No. That's what marriage is about. There is a context for that love. But when it becomes boyfriend and girlfriend, we have boyfriends and girlfriends. It sounds innocent. 
Well, if it's a woman talking about her girlfriend, then yeah, definitely it's innocent. But if it's a man talking about his girlfriend, then we have something else altogether. Is there a place for boyfriend-girlfriend relations in Islam? On the campus here, there is a sign which says, no coupling on campus. Coupling actually is a, we'll have to call that um, uh, Malay English. <laughs> You're not going to find it anywhere outside of here. Coupling, right? Coupling is, it's, you know, when you, when you link certain things together like chains and you, you couple the chains. But human beings, coupling, no. <laughs> but in spite of the big sign saying no coupling on campus, we find couples sitting right under the sign. We have a problem. This is a problem. It is a cultural problem. It has become a norm. In the West, of course, it's normal. Parents, you know, encourage their little kids in kindergarten. You know, parents, they, when they, they go to pick up their kids and the little kid says, Oh, this is my girlfriend. Oh, kiss her. Only three years old for it. Give her a kiss. Pick a pic, take a picture and you know. It's very, very. So, okay. That's a culture which promotes love outside of marriage as a norm. They argue and they defend it. What's the difference between fornication and marriage, a piece of paper, that's all it is, that piece of paper. But no, in Islam, it is about protecting the family, protecting the building blocks of the society. It's more than a piece of paper. It is a concept. And that is why the law is so severe. Islamic hudud, which address adultery and fornication, etc. Very severe. People are shocked when they hear it. You stone people to death. Lash them a hundred times. Just for that? Well, Islam takes that position because it wants to protect that foundation. To have a wholesome society where children are raised with a proper understanding of their roles, their relationships, etc. From what I understand here, there is another phenomenon connected to this where we have homosexuals who are accepted. They will walk among the girls and the girls will play and laugh and joke with them. And the society turns a blind eye. And of course, if you listen to the Protestants, it's love. God is love. Love is good. Whoever you love, just love someone. You know, that's, that's not Islam. 
That's another society. And we know how Allah dealt with those people who chose that form of love. The standards which Islam has set are not flexible. When some people ask me, can a Muslim be a homosexual? Or can a homosexual become a Muslim? Yes. It's possible. But it is a sinful state. If that person fulfills his desires or her desires through homosexual love. Even if they get married. In Islam, there is no room for that. But other religions which evolve with the times, you know, when you ask Protestants about it, they say, hey, you have to keep up with the times, man. Times have changed. Society has changed. You know, you guys are very rigid and fossilized. Harsh. God is love. So they reinterpret the clear punishments and condemnation for homosexuality found in the Old Testament. They even go so far as to make a play. Jesus Christ Superstar in which Jesus is portrayed as a homosexual. Astaghfirullah. So, these are among the forbidden loves, forbidden forms of love, which have spread and have established roots in the society, which need to be rooted out. So when we talk about love, we need to go back to the original teachings of Islam. It is from Satan, without a doubt. This love, these desires, fulfillment of one's desires in these means or these ways is without a doubt from none other than Satan. And Allah says, Zuyina lil nasi hubbu shahawat. The love of those desires, this has been beautified for them. Beautified for them by none other than Satan himself. Just as in the time of Adam and Eve when they were created, put in the garden, told they could eat from any of the trees except for this one tree. What did Satan do? He came and beautified that tree. He called it Shajaratul Khuld, the tree of eternal life. This is beautification. The tree of eternal life, why? So that Adam would feel, Adam and Eve would feel that they need to eat from this tree. They didn't. They had all of the other options in the garden except for one tree. And Shaitan's program was to beautify that tree in their minds, in their hearts, till they loved it, wanted it, and felt their lives would not be fulfilled without it. 
so they ate. That's the story of our lives. And those forbidden loves, they are replication of that same process from the past. We're just repeating the same error over and over again. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had said, Ar'ayta man ittakhada ilahu hawa, have you not seen the one who takes his desires as his God? When we follow our desires in this way, the desire to have a boyfriend or to have a girlfriend, the desires, homosexual desires or lesbian desires, when we choose that route, we have taken our desires as our gods. They become our god. And we worship them. We worship those desires. And we love them and love what we get from them more than we love Allah. So in fact, we fall into shirk. Major shirk in doing this. Where we justify, we find a million and one excuses for these insidious practices. So when we talk about love, we have to talk about loving Allah, first and foremost. Loving Allah, as the Prophet ﷺ had said, none of you has truly believed until I become more beloved to him or her than his child or her child, father, parent, or the whole world. Our love for Allah and His Messenger should supersede our love for anyone in this world. And that is the proof of our faith. Otherwise, we call ourselves Muslims, we have Muslim names, we do things that Muslims do, but as the Prophet ﷺ had said, there are people who will do, Sahih Muslim, the deeds of the people of paradise, but they will be from the people of hell. They will do the deeds of the people of paradise. As it appears to people, they fast, they pray, they make hajj, they do these things. These are the deeds of the people of paradise. But, the Prophet ﷺ had said, they will be from the people of hell. And the dividing line between this side and that side is over the issue of love. Let us not have any doubts about it. It's over the issue of love, it's over the issue of trusting, it's over the issue of fear. It's over a number of issues. But tonight, we are focusing on the issue of love. Since it is so important, it is so popular to talk about, it is infused in our lives through the media. We can't seem to get away from it. We need to go back to this. Otherwise, we are fooling ourselves. We are fooling ourselves. We think we are Muslims. We call ourselves Muslims. 
But in reality, we are living a lie. I ask Allah to protect us from this state and to bring us back to the state of Islam in which we love Allah more than everything else. And that verse that we began with, وَمِنَ النَّاسِ مَنْ يَتَّخِذُ مِنْ دُونِ اللَّهِ أَنْدَادًا يُحِبُّونَهُمْ كَحُبِّ اللَّهِ And there is among human beings those who take for worship others besides Allah as equals to Him. يُحِبُّونَهُمْ كَحُبِّ اللَّهِ Allah then says, وَالَّذِينَ آمَنُوا أَشَدُّ حُبًّا لِلَّهِ But those who believe, means meaning to say that those who don't believe, there are those who love what is displeasing to Allah more than the love of Allah. Those who believe, then their love of Allah is greater. So that's the proof of our faith. If we want to know where we stand before Allah, then we need to address these issues and address whatever other loves we may have. For other people, that love may be tobacco, smoking, cigarettes. It may be drugs. There are many other things out there. Maybe money. The love for money, which drives our presence here, for example, in the International Islamic University. We're here to get a piece of paper so we can make money. And we choose our professions based on the one which will get us the most money. That's the love of money. We're not seeking knowledge as prescribed by the Prophet ﷺ. We are in love with money. And that is what drives us. And the Prophet ﷺ had said, Ta'isa, Abdul Dinar, Abdul Dirham, Abdul Dinar, that the worshipper of the Dirham and the Dinar, the Ringgit, will always be wretched. Will be wretched. And whatever we love, greater than Allah, it will make our lives wretched. Because we will not be able to get what we want from it. It will be fleeting. It will be there for a minute and it's gone. And we're running after it all the time. It is only with the remembrance of Allah, Allah bi dhikrillahi tatma'in al qulub. So it is only with that love of Allah which causes us to remember Him throughout our lives that we ultimately will find happiness and find peace. It won't be in any of these other things. So. My brothers and sisters, I encourage you to stop for a minute and reflect. Many of us are caught up in currents. We're just going along we've, in a stream. We don't really have any control. We don't have time to stop and think about it. We're just in it. We need to stop and think. Because we really don't know when we will breathe our last. As young people, you might think, I got a lot of time. How many young people didn't have a lot of time? That's reality. So we need to stop and think. 
and to turn back to Allah and to love Him and worship Him through our love of Him by obeying the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam we need to do that in order for this Ummah to succeed it is the only way we can chase the dunya replicate the West their lifestyles etc but where does it lead what is at the end of it all wretchedness we have something which the rest of the world does not have Islam we need to preserve it we need to take care of it we need to live it as it deserves to be lived those were the thoughts I wanted to share with you this evening I hope they serve as a reminder and I remind myself before I remind you all because shaitan, Satan is ever busy. He is ever busy. And Allah said, take him as your enemy. And this is one of the main routes that he comes at us through. Love. Love of this world. The permissible things going to excess. Or love of the forbidden things. Barakallah fikum. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.